All right. So my talk is called Modern Netless Reverse Engineering. And uh, the reason I say this is because a lot of the previous work on netless reversing has been focused on, oh, I'm going to go figure out the bit stream from this one particular chip, or I'm going to go make a tool that turns photos of an ASIC into some degree of uh, circuit netlist. And I'm trying to focus more on what happens next. How do we turn this pile of gates into something useful? So uh, by way of background, uh, I came to IOActive from Rensselaer Polytechnic and uh, did a PhD in computer science there. I've been doing FPGA development and uh, silicon reversing for a while now. Uh, I also taught what I believe is, feel free to correct me if there's one I don't know about, but I believe it's still the only uh, full semester course ever taught at a university on semiconductor reverse engineering. And so really what we want is we want a full-on reverse engineering tool suite for semiconductor netlists. And uh, we want eventually something as well-developed as IDO. It's a long way from happening so far. But the state of the art in general in hardware reversing is way behind where software is. So in the software world, we have disassemblers for pretty much every major CPU architecture. We have decompilers that will go from disassembled assembly language up to some sort of C-like pseudocode. And what we're starting to see now in some of the newer decompiler disassembler suites is rather than writing a decompiler for each assembly instruction set separately, instead, it'll convert from the native instruction set of your target processor up to some sort of intermediate representation, and then from there up to a higher level pseudocode. And in general, there's, there's nothing like this for hardware. And so, as I mentioned, having one desynthesizer per FPGA architecture, per ASIC cell library, does not scale. It's just not practical. And so what we can do is we can create a series of front ends for different device architectures, different technology libraries, lift this up to a common IR, then we do feature extraction of that IR, and we output what will eventually become usable behavioral Verilog. And so for the sake of initial demonstration of the prototype, I decided it made sense to target a product term CPLD and a LUT-based FPGA because these are two very different microarchitectures and show off how, what the, basically the main advantage of the IR-based flow. And uh, I went with small devices because they were easy to test. They were relatively inexpensive if I fried some of them during testing, and uh, we'll get to some of that later on. <laughs> and uh, they also had known bitstream structures. Uh, the green packs were interesting in that they're, as far as I know, the only currently actively supported for sale programmable logic device in which the vendor documents the bitstream. And uh, then Cool Runner is obviously not documented as a Xilinx part. However, it wasn't that difficult to figure out. I did a talk at Recon in 2015 in which I reversed somewhere around 80, 90% of the bitstream. And since that time, uh, me and Robert, my collaborator, have figured out the remainder of the netlist format. So now we have complete bitstream format for Cool Runner decoded. And actually, I have a synthesizable Verilog model of a 2C32A that runs on an FPGA. I can JTAG it just like the real chip. And as far as I can tell, it's functionally identical. I don't model all the timing of the EEPROM and boot process. So when you JTAG it, the both the, the EEPROM erase and the firmware loading run a little bit faster than the real hardware does. But once you actually get the netlist loaded, as far as you can tell, it's functionally equivalent, although obviously not time equivalent to the real device. And this is actually how I did final verification that my bitstream format is correct, is diff the actual chip against the simulation model. I need to do a little more kind of fuzz testing, but I haven't found any mismatches lately. Anyway, so at this point, these are known structures. We can focus on not reversing the bitstream, but on reversing the higher level structures out of the netlists. And both these devices are at least somewhat supported by open tool chains. I wrote a place and route in a Yosis based synthesis backend for Greenpack, and Robert is working with me on the Cool Runner backend. And so what this means is we're able to go create test code that has very low level control over various aspects of the device. And also it means we're not using vendor tooling while doing this. So for example, Xilinx's tool chain has an annoying clause in their license agreement that says various things that could be interpreted to say you're not allowed to reverse engineer bitstreams. However, if the bitstream didn't come from a Xilinx compiler, you're totally fine. And uh, so uh, most of my examples came from Greenpack just because the Cool Runner forward flow is a little bit less well-developed. And as a result, uh, we have to go 
twiddle bits by hand sometimes in order to create some of these test structures. So it's a little bit more of a pain in the neck to create examples for prototyping with. But I do have a couple I'll get to in a bit. And obviously down the road, we do want to be able to use this to reverse engineer arbitrary silicon. There's been some good work both at IOActive internally and elsewhere on this. And uh, unfortunately, most of the other players in the field aren't sharing their code and ours isn't up to the point we can actually use it for anything yet. So this is kind of a future work category. Uh, this photo actually is of the Cool Runner. I had to do some low-level silicon work in order to figure out the switch boxes. This is in the global routing matrix. We've got uh, six TSRAM cells there storing the configuration bits. Then this is actually, it's a bunch of fingers, but up on the next layer, it's split. There's a pass transistor here and one here, and it ends up forming an eight to one MUX that routes in signals from the global routing and out to the product term array. Anyway, we're not gonna get into too much detail on that. But what we want essentially is something that will go take a photo of a standard cell or eventually millions of standard cells turn them into a transistor level net list, turn that into a gate. And then that's kind of boring from my perspective. I want to take the output of this not yet existing front end and go work from there. And so what we end up getting as an output from a low level net list front end for ASIC is it'll end up extracting polygons. So we've got an SRAM cell here. You can see we've got the inverter loop. It's a little hard to see in this render, but the inverter loop, we've got the uh, word select here. The bit lines come off here and here. And uh, then that turns into something here where we have a series of cells. We have an SRM cell, we have a NOR gate, and we have a couple of pass transistors driving a common output. And so, okay, we have this. Now, how do we go make sense of this? How do we go interpret some higher level structure? And so the next device that we're targeting is the Silago Green Pack family. These are, I like to describe them as a baby PSOC. We're looking at low tens of lots. The one I'm targeting has 25 or 26, depending on how you count. What's actually a little interesting is they're variable sized. Every other FPGA I've looked at has LUT 4s, LUT 3s, LUT 6s. Green Pack has LUT 2s all the way up to LUT 4s and some 3s in between. And this is actually a bit of a challenge from a place and route perspective, trying to do packing of LUTs into heterogeneous structures. But the nice thing about the IR flow is once we figure out how these LUTs are formatted, and again, the vendor tells us, we can just turn them back into Boolean logic equations and then go run logic minimization on the output, and we don't care what the original structure was. And then they've also got some interesting stuff like oscillator, some analog hard IP. My flow right now doesn't do any kind of analog modeling, so I just convert analog blocks into primitive instantiations, and I work around them, and I focus on the digital stuff. The digital blocks are actually lifted up into IR as well. So the counter hard IP, the shift register hard IP, those become counter and shift register cells in the IR with some tweaks around them. For example, active low versus active high resets get unified into a common form factor and so on. And so we don't care what the original hard IP looked like. And so the front end here will do something like this. We take in a sequence of ones and zeros. Their, their bitstream format is extremely verbose. It actually has indexes and then ASCII ones and zeros and then comments for each line for the bit format. And then this just happens to be the configuration for a LUT. So if you go do the math that you can actually see the LUT equation is right here. The routing matrix is shown separately. This is just the LUT equation storage. And so we've got the initialization value and then we've got the net numbers for the inputs and outputs. Then the next device that we targeted was the Xilinx Cool Runner 2. Um, as of now, I only have support for the 2C32A. The 64 and larger have essentially the same internal microarchitecture. However, the routing matrix has some mask programmed muxes on metal 3 to metal 4 vias. And I haven't found a way to dump that reliably black box. So it's just a matter of me finding time to go get samples of these other dyes, polish them down to M3, M4 vias, and go take a couple of photos to figure out the patterns. But so far, it hasn't really been a priority, so I've kind of been putting it off. And so this is a pretty standard PLA-based CPLD. We've got two function blocks. Each function block has uh, 16 macro cells. Uh, there's 56 by uh, 16 for the PLA, so 56 inputs. It's actually 112 because the inputs can be inverted. Then uh, 16 OR gate outputs. Some of the PLA macro cell terms also can be the uh, and array terms can be fed into the array as well to do things like local clocks and clock enables and things like that. But again, we're not going to get too much into the microarchitecture here. That was my recon talk two years ago. And so 
the front end here, again, pretty much does the same thing that the green pack front end does. So we take in a big pile of equations. This is the global routing matrix. This is the PLA and array. And uh, Cool Runner is also a little interesting in that since it is non-volatile, the EEPROM starts out as ones, and therefore almost all the configuration for Cool Runner is active low. And so here we've got two inputs to an and array term are active, and we can see the front end turns this into, we've got function block one, uh, product term 10, we've got a list of complemented and true inputs, and then we have output function block zero, p term 10. And so at this point, we haven't done any of the untack mapping. We still have native cell libraries. All we've done is bitstream up to low level cell instances. So this is the equivalent of uh, what a pre-placed and route netlist would look like. And uh, then finally, I have some level of support for the Lattice Ice 40. Uh, Clifford Wolf and some of the other guys from the Ice Storm team have done some great work here. And so I didn't have to reverse engineer the bitstream. They did it for me. So they've got some on die memory. They've got a uh, decent number of on die uh, four lookup tables. They've got some block rim. They've got some PLLs. And again, there's an open source tool chain. And uh, they actually had a front end written already that went from uh, a behavior, sorry, from a bit stream up to a very low level Verilog netlist. So it's not quite cell primitive instantiations, but it's one assignment statement per lot with some very ugly looking Boolean logic. It is logically equivalent to the same thing. It's just a little less readable. And so... Uh, what we get from the output of all these front ends, we get a native netlist. It's a bunch of standard cells. There's no structure. I do minimal optimizations just to say any cells that don't drive an output pin, go get rid of just so they're not cluttering things down the road. But that's about it. And so here's what a native netlist for a cool runner looks. You can see again, it's just a big pile of standard cell instances. And then for green, uh, sorry, for, no, for Greenpack, um, for ICE40, the existing tool already kind of skips this phase and gets sort of into the untack mapping phase as well. And so the next step we do is we run technology mapping backwards. We create a behavioral model of each of the library cells and we replace each cell instance with that behavioral model and then run minimization in order to merge away all of the extra inverters and things that get formed when you do this. And as I said earlier, analog and mixing IP is preserved as instances and we don't really care about that. We're interested in what's happening around that. And so here's an example of uh, the um, IR for a green pack device. So you can see we've got the flip-flop outputs. We've got, uh, looks like, more flip-flop outputs, some counter status, and so on. And again, generic names. We have no idea what anything means at this point. And it's all single bits. We haven't figured out vectors or any kind of multi-bit structure yet. And the IR for, <coughs> the IR for a uh, cool runner looks very similar. It's very slightly differently structured just because of the fact that we have an and or array and then XOR gates coming off of that. But once you run, before we haven't run minimization yet. Once you run logic minimization on here, they end up looking the same. And so now we can get to the fun part, which is desynthesis. You want to go find structures in this intermediate net list. You want to replace them with more abstract equivalents. And in many cases, we can actually reuse work from the coarse grain synthesis flows in order to find structures. So normally, say you're trying to map to a device that has hard IP for shift registers. So you would go find chains of flip-flops in the behavioral net list, and you go replace that with a shift register cell. In this case, we're doing the opposite. We're taking a chain of flip-flops, which may or may not have been mapped to hard IP, we don't care, and replace that with a shift register going upwards. So now it's a technology-independent generic shift register cell. And interestingly enough, that's the first example we have. So users already had this flow, and they were using it for coarse grain synthesis in order to map to primitive shift registers in the hardware. However, if we have physical flip-flops somewhere that aren't actually part of a shift register cell in the target ASIC or FPGA or whatever, it doesn't matter. We can discover that they're logically a shift register and create a shift register out of this. And so in this render, all the fun parameters like the reset value and the chain length and so on aren't shown. They're still stored internally. If you output to a Verilog netlist, you will see that. Most of my renders here are just graph is output because it's a little bit easier to show on slides in front of a large audience. And uh, so you can see we've got the clock comes in from here, D in goes there, and then foo sub two it then goes to D out, and then foo zero and foo one have no other loads, so they're all absorbed into the cell. And so the next thing that we did was adders. Now, this is a little bit less trivial than you might think. In particular, you can't naively just look for chains of half adders and full adders, or, well, extract half adders and full adders out of Boolean logic and then chain them. 
because although this will tell you the adder, it won't tell you which input is which. So if we look at the original HDL here, we have pins 22, 7, and 14 are the first input, 3, 19, 6, 15 are the next one. But if we now go look at what the output of our tool produced, it is 3, 19, 7, 15. So 3, 19, 7, 15. See, the problem is that binary addition is commutative, and uh, we can't tell which bits of a given place value are which. So if you swap the ones place of your two add-ins, or the twos place, or the fours place, we can't tell they're logically equivalent. So you cannot assume that the inputs to an adder are actually logically connected in any way. So this does get to be a little bit of a gotcha later on when we start doing bus extraction. You can't assume that just because the inputs were put there as inputs, or even if we have, say, a uh, bitwise AND operation, again, we can't tell which of the inputs to the AND are which. So if we have a multi-bit bitwise AND, we can tell these things all getting added together, but I don't know which of these input bits were logically tied to each other. However, what we do know is the output of the addition is logically a vector because we have an LSB, we have an MSB, the adder chain tells us which is which, and we know conceptually this is one multi-bit vector. And so we kind of start to get into this a little bit as well as if we have multi-inputs, if we have, say, two AND gates and the output of one feeds into another, logically it's a three-input AND gate. And so we can go do some fairly simple extractions to go find these multi-bit reductions. And this start, starts to tie into down the road when we start finding more complex structures like comparators that we can use multi-bit gates to do this. Another common structure that is useful is a toggle flip-flop. So just a flip-flop that changes state every clock cycle instead of one that loads a new input every clock cycle. And these are pretty commonly used in things like counters or even just to blink LEDs. And so uh, this is pretty easy to find using the extract capability in Yosis. Again, this is meant for coarse grain synthesis, but it's not too hard to flip around and use for desynthesis as well. And uh, so... Uh, we can now, once we've found these toggle flip-flops, we can go look for counters the same way. So if you have a power of two counter, you've got a flip-flop at the bottom that toggles at your clock frequency over two, your next bit toggles at your clock frequency over four, your next bit toggles at your clock frequency over eight, and so on. And so you can chain T flip-flops pretty easily to go make an arbitrary binary counter with a power of two period. And so we have inference for this already. Uh, right now, we don't actually do the overflow detection within the counter cell just because it's a little easier to do it in two phases. So we create a counter that has a parallel output, and then we use the parallel output of that to indicate we've overflowed the counter and we're going to go do something else. And then internally, it also loops back to detect, okay, we're resetting the counter because we've hit two to the n or zero, depending on if we're counting up or down. And... Uh, we do still need a little bit more work in here for non-power of two counters. So if you, instead of if you just count from zero until you max out and overflow naturally, if you have explicit overflow circuitry to reset the counter once you've hit, say, 17 for a 5-bit counter instead of 31, then you have to actually infer this reset circuitry. So at this point, we're able to detect we've got a series of multi-bit AND gates. We've got some of the inputs inverted, so it's not too hard to tell. We are matching to detect that we are resetting the counter back to zero. We just haven't done the inference logic to go and fold this back into the counter yet. And so I touched on this a little bit earlier on. Some blocks have inherent ordering on their outputs. So the parallel output of a counter is a multi-bit vector. The output of an adder is a multi-bit vector. The output of a block RAM is a multi-bit vector, and so on. And so we can recursively iterate on this in order to find more and more structures. So if we know one side of an adder is a vector, by elimination, the other side is a vector. And alternatively, if we see half the inputs to an adder come from one vector and half the inputs come on the other side come from vector, we can shuffle these inputs back around. This is still kind of a work in progress, but we can use this so that if we know one side of the adder collectively, or at least one bit from every place value, if we know which vector it belongs to by elimination, we can find which vector the other side belongs to. And there's still room for a little more optimization. So you can see here, we've got the output of this counter, then you feed it to a whole bunch of not gates and then an AND. So this is a little bit annoying. It's verbose. There's a lot of fluff to it. So the next thing we can do is, uh, uh, sorry, I, I, uh, go into a little more detail on this. So the way that Graph is, is rendering this using Yosis is here we've got the output is showing as a series of scalar nets, and then we have individual nets going out here. And uh, now we've got a slightly different render after this pass. So now we've got this net number six is now a multi-bit vector, and now we're extracting individual bits of that and feeding it into our gate. 
But again, there's a little bit of fluff here. And the other thing you can see is the AND gate, all the inputs are commutative. The ordering of the inputs isn't quite what it kind of logically should be coming out from the counter. So there's a little bit of crossovers here that's a little bit ugly, and we can clean this all up. And so the next step is uh, if we have inputs to a multi-bit vector that are going into a multi-bit gate where the inputs can be swapped, like an AND gate or something like that, we can reorder the inputs in order to be in numerical order so we don't have to deal with all of this uh, annoying crossing of wires in the render. And we can also take adverters on the input and we can push them through a multi-bit gate and produce the Demorgan equivalent. And in this case, the Demorgan equivalent is a lot smaller. So now we've got an inverter here. We've got a OR instead of an AND and the counter output went right in there. So basically what we're doing is we're checking if the entire register of the counter has hit zero or not. And this actually turned out to be useful for synthesis. It can reduce the area of some circuits if you're actually trying to produce logic from your behavioral netlist originally. So this is actually in mainline Yosis now for synthesis. And so at this point, we're going to start looking at some of the less trivial tests. So we've shown individual features one at a time and what's going on with them. And so visualization is still a work in progress. Right now, we're using the show command in Yosis, which just produces a dot file and renders the graph is. And this is a couple of problems. It's slow. It's not interactive. It doesn't give you all the nice things IDA can do, where you can like click on a wire and change the name of it, or decide, do I want to show this gate as the De Morgan equivalent or not, which makes more sense for the semantics of circuit. It doesn't let you select hierarchy and say, OK, these things are logical. Let me go group them as a module. And also, as you'll see in the next couple of slides, it has very poor handling of any kind of a net with a high fan out, so a clock or a reset or something like that. So we're going to start out with a nice simple example. It's an LED chaser running on green packs. So we've got a power of two binary counter, and then the output of that counter goes into a shift register, and then we just shift, I think, four LEDs in a row. We've got So one's blinking, then the next one, then the next one, then the next one. And so we've got two shift registers chained end to end, then we've got an LED toggling off a six kilohertz RC oscillator. And so when we run that bitstream through our desynthesis flow, what we end up getting is we've got a counter clock and reset come in from externally, and then the output of that counter is anded with reset done so that we don't get glitches and have our LEDs do weird things during power up. And then the output of that goes into a toggle flip flop, which is kind of cropping this one, but here you can see we've got the toggle input comes from our counter overflowing because the counter cells in green pack output just a single clock pulse whenever they underflow, and we want our LEDs to have a nice even duty cycle. So we've just got a toggle flip flop to clean up the duty cycle to give us a 50% square wave going out to uh, pin number 19 there. And then if we zoom out a little bit, we can see here there's a bunch more structures. We've got different counters running off of different clock sources. We've got one oscillator up here, one oscillator up here, and that's all running out to drive different stuff. And then we also have a post divider in Fabric Logic here. I'm still debugging why my counter extraction didn't match this one counter and it matched all the other ones. But this is an additional divider that's running on the output of one of the other counters in order to say, OK, we want to have a really slow toggling LED here. And so now let's look at something a little bit fancier. We have 10 base T auto negotiation. This is actually a bit of a challenge to fit in a chip that had 26 LUTs and a dozen flip flops. But I did actually manage to fit this in there. It will link up when you plug it into an Ethernet switch. It doesn't actually send or receive any frames yet. But uh, the chip is small enough. I've thought it would be fun to go jam one inside of an RJ45 jack and add a couple of LDOs and resistors or something to power it off PoE. And then you can just go screw with people by having a floating RJ45 jack that links up when you plug it into a PoE switch. But it also made a cool demo just as a slightly less trivial circuit that we can reverse engineer. So. The final rendered netlist starts to get a little bit big, and you can see we're hitting limitations of the visualization tools I'm using already, even with something this small. But if we zoom in a little bit here, we're looking at the pattern generator. So originally, we had hard IP for generating this repeating bit pattern, which is the sequence of fast blink pulses that are used uh, in the auto negotiation to say we are 10 base T, half end full duplex, and we're acknowledging whatever the other end sent. We, I cheated a little bit. I didn't actually look at the incoming link code word. Anyway, so. The decompilation extracts this hard IP into a counter and then a series of Boolean gates that are pattern matching for that particular pattern. So we've flattened out all the fancy functions of this hard IP, and now we have just a counter and some generic logic. So we could retarget this thing for some other device now, and it's not using any 
hard IP that's specific to our target device anymore. And here's where we really start to see how bad Graph is at is just rendering circuit net lists. So this is pretty much the sum total of the RTL we have running here. It's just an 8-bit UART, 8 and 1 hard-coded with a variable baud rate. And we have this massive net list. And this isn't even the whole thing. I had to crop it a little bit in order to get an aspect ratio that it would fit on the screen. And if we zoom in a little bit, we can see how few cells there actually are. There's not that many gates. Most of this is wires. This is just graph is being really bad at handling high fan out nets. And uh, there is still a bit more work to do. As you can see, this is what the same rendering tool shows about the original UART. If we synthesize it and we haven't tech mapped it yet, this is what it looked like. So it's still a little bit fluffy, and there's still probably ways we could render it better and make it a little more understandable. But this is at least something we could work with. So we still have a ways to go to recover some of the higher level structure. But rendering does need some work. <laughs> The big problem is that Graphis doesn't seem to understand that clocks and resets and other high fan out control signals are conceptually the same signal going everywhere. So it tries and renders a non-overlapping directed edge to every single one of these flip-flops, and it tries to expand everything so that none of these wires cross, and you can still tell which wire goes where. And it ends up inflating the area of your rendered netlist by probably one to two orders of magnitude. So it makes it very hard to follow where anything goes. So at this point, what I think we're going to have to do is kind of put a halt on some of the fun higher-level netless structures and focus more on visualizations because we can't really debug our analytics if we don't have a visualization that can keep up with it. And I'm also going to touch a little bit on uh, bitstream extraction. So obviously, you have to get a bitstream to reverse. So if you have clear text from our update files, great. That's easy. Problem solved. Uh, if the bitstreams are stored off chip and encrypted, there's a couple of different ways you can do it. Uh, I've seen some pretty good papers on differential power analysis. Pretty much every FPGA that I've seen that had on chip bitstream encryption, eventually someone developed the DPA attack that let them read bitstreams by recovering the key. It may have taken a few hundred or a few thousand boots, but so what? You can get the key out. And. Uh, then, obviously, there are some nice techniques you can use to uh, defeat the lock bits if they're on chip. Like, uh, Sergey has done some good work with the uh, Prysic 3 showing some techniques that I believe would eventually let you read out bit streams even when the device was locked. Uh, I have some conjectures that it might be possible to read antifuse-based FPGAs with uh, FIB voltage contrast. I don't have any data to support this. It's just kind of something I think might be worth looking into. And uh, so down the road, where we're looking at going with the toolchain eventually, obviously I want to have an interactive GUI. It's not practical to go make something that will go one click from bitstream to behavioral Verilog and automatically know what you want. There's going to have to be a human in the loop. You're going to have to go give it some guidance. You're going to have to go figure out some structure by hand. And so there needs to be a UI that lets you drag things around and say, okay, conceptually this is my UART. This is my, say, uh, spy flash control. This is my HDMI output core, whatever. This is my Ethernet Mac. And you've got to be able to group things by functional subsystems. And you're going to be able to get some of that by physical topology, but some of it you're going to have to figure out by hand from the netlist. And uh, then, obviously, there needs to be support for more devices on the front end, eventually with like an ASIC front end. The analytics need a lot more work. We can find some simpler structures like counters and things like that now. But what about finding more complex structures like wide input muxes and vector muxes and things like that? There's a, there's a bit more work that has to be done to support some of that. And uh, also, another major thing we don't have right now is we don't have the ability to easily trace from the final output netlist back to the original input and uh, determine which physical lot a given signal was driven by. And if we start getting down to the invasive attack, suppose we're trying to recover a key that's running on this FPGA down the road or something like that, it may be necessary to do an invasive attack on that device in order to recover data or to modify behavior. Say we got hold of one device we've managed to extract, say it's an ASIC instead of an FPJ. We've managed to uh, recover the full netlist of that device. We've managed to find where some of the crypto engine is, and now we want to go get the keys out of there. Okay, so now we have, in our behavioral model of the chip, we have uh, the uh, sources that draw, that read this key and go do AS on it. Now we have to go find back the layout where this thing is. And so there needs to be metadata preserved through this entire flow that allows us to go back to the original source netlist and say, okay, this particular register maps to this register in the original input netlist at these XY coordinates on metal two. 
And another thing I'd like to get, and this should be fairly easy based on known machine vision techniques, is physical IP recognition. As in, if you have an SRAM core or a PLL or an eFuse array or something like that, these are supplied as polygons by the foundry. So it shouldn't be that difficult to use standard machine vision techniques in order to recognize these things in a low-level net list before we even do the untack mapping and replace it with a more abstract structure like just a two-dimensional array of registers or just a black box IP car. And eventually, another thing I think would be cool, I don't know anything about machine learning to determine how feasible this is, but I feel like it should be possible to create a classifier that will go, you draw a box around an unknown IP blob, but it'll tell you that's probably SRAM, that's probably a PLL. And then you can either skip it and say that's not interesting, or you can go spend more time looking at it by hand. So that'd be nice to have. I haven't the slightest idea how to implement it. <laughs> Uh, another thing that I'd really like to have, and this is also kind of a long-term moonshot, I'd like something along the lines of Ida Flirt for IP cores that are supplied as just a netlist. So if I have a Cortex-M3 that I've synthesized with particular options and I've dropped down into my chip, can I go find this after the fact, including all of the registry timing and things synthesis does? I don't know. Graphite isomorphism is known to be NP-complete, and... Uh, whether there are randomized or heuristic algorithms that work most of the time well enough, I don't know, but it is on the roadmap for once we get the lower level stuff a little more well developed, we'd like to be able to find known IP so that we don't waste time reverse engineering some CPU that is just, okay, it's an ARM CPU, we're not too interested in the microarchitecture, we want to know where the firmware comes from. We want to know when it writes to this register, where does it go? That's the stuff we care about. And so this is kind of where we'd like to take it eventually. Then the code is all available online now. Uh, we have most of the higher level analytics are in my fork of Yosis. I'm in the process of merging these things back to mainline. About probably half to two thirds of the stuff I talked about in the slides are already in mainline Yosis, and the remainder need a little more work. In particular, the uh, toggle flip flops, the toggle flip flop counters, and uh, the adders all apparently don't meet Clifford's standards for how he wants things structured. So it's going to be a little while before we get those merged, and there may be some refactoring and tweaking. But everything is in my fork. That's all permissive ISC license. And then the front end for Cool Runner and Green Pack are in a separate repo. Those also include a full place route for Cool Runner and partial support, or sorry, full place route for Green Pack and partial support for Cool Runner. That's LGPL. And then separately, obviously, there's the Ice Storm tools if you're trying to do uh, the Ice 40 front end. Um, I do want to thank, before I go any further, uh, John McMaster did a lot of great work uh, on the Cool Runners. The dye photos there were all done in his lab. He did all the deprocessing. The You can't see it in the overview, but uh, there was dash hatching on there to go pull out dopant patterns. Uh, Clifford did a lot of great work in Yosis. He helped out immensely. A lot of new features that I was going to go right, he just banged out in one evening before I could even figure out how it had to be done. So he was very useful. And uh, before we close, I am going to mention one more thing that kind of came out of this work is uh, the uh, Cool Runner 2 routing fabric is a one-hot matrix. So we have in this example, we've got uh, uh, one pull to high, one pull to low, and then two of the six possible nets that can go into this one row of the switch box. The thing is, these are one-hot coded. We have individual SRAM cells that control all of these. So if you go do the math and say, okay, this is a PFET, we want to pull the input low, this is an NFET, we want to pull the input high, these are all NFETs. So if we turn on all these transistors at once by having the uh, pull low be a 1, then this be a 0, and then all the others be 1s, now we end up getting in a state in which this is, this is kind of a little bit uh, simplified. I'm not showing the whole routing matrix. But what we end up doing is creating a state in which every gate in the routing matrix is turned on at once, and we're creating a short between all six of the switch box inputs plus power and ground. And so now what we do is we initialize all the flip-flops in the device so that half of them are high and half of them are low, and we twiddle them around a little bit so that on average, half the inputs to every switch box are constant high, half the inputs are low, and we short them all together. And after about 10 minutes, the chip fried. And I was actually surprised at how long it lasted. I was hoping that maybe if I just did one or two, that it'd either brown out the device and cause it to either run into a reset loop or maybe the JTAG circuit would stop working because it wasn't getting enough current or something like that. But with one or two of these things, my power supply barely even registered an increase in current. I ended up having to do every switch box in the whole device 
and short all of them, and it still took about 10 minutes before I stopped responding. I did go pop it in the FIB and attempt to do some failure analysis. I'm pretty sure there's an electron migration failure somewhere in one of the power rails. I couldn't find it. So maybe if I played around a little more with voltage contrast imaging and stuff like that, maybe I'd be able to actually go find the short. It would be a cool thing to put in my next talk. As of now, all I know is I did succeed in frying the device, and I'm not entirely sure what part of it failed. So at this point, I'll take questions. Seeing none, I guess we're done. Thank you.